Hello everyone, and this is BioPhoenix here, and Happy New Year everyone. So, as again, we're going to be doing the once a year video talking about the games that I beat in 2022. And of course, these are games that I played on my own time for fun, not counting like the reviews and such since, you know, I've already done like whole length videos on those. These are the games that I played by myself that I haven't really talked that much about. So yeah, not much else needed to say here. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. And yeah, this one is actually a lot shorter than like the past couple years, mainly because, well, 2022 was not nearly as much as a shit show as uh, 2020 and 21, because for obvious reasons, Plus, on top of that, I've also just been, like, trying out different things that I haven't, like, focused on in a long time and just been working on other things. So, yeah, it's just the way how life goes sometimes. But anyways, let's just get right to it. So, the very first game that I completed in 2022 was Sturmfront on PC. So this is an indie game that is a top-down uh, twin-stick shooter that is just really fucking awesome. Has lots of blood and violence everywhere, has a lot of like awesome kick-ass like metal music. And I really love the pixel art in this game, it's just really nice and well-detailed looking. And this game definitely does remind me of something from uh, like Smash TV kind of thing. So if you really love games like that, but like with more like over-the-top shit in it, I think this is a really good one that I can highly recommend. And the next game we got here is another short indie game on Steam that I got, and that happens to be Tori 3D. There's two of these games, I only played the first one, and I have to say, this was a kind of like a nice, fun, chill type of game. Not very long at all, you can probably beat it in one sitting, in fact I actually did when I played through this game, but it was just kind of like a mindless fun sort of experience. So it's kind of like a 3D platformer where you just gotta like run around across different platforms and it has like like the 90s like early 3D. In fact I find this game kind of reminds me of like a Sega Saturn game. And as the farther you get through the game, the more like weird stuff starts to happen and it actually really took me by surprise. So if you can get this game like really cheap, well hell I think like the base price of it is like less than like $5 if I'm not mistaken, then yeah I think it's at least worth it just for like a nice fun playthrough. Alright, now, the next game we got here is a very surprising one. So this is a game that is from FromSoft, yeah, from FromSoft, yes. It starts with an E, and it has the word ring in it, and it happens to be... Eternal Ring on PS2. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> oh, better luck next time, buddy! Yeah, sorry Elden Ring, but you just didn't get the job. <laughs> okay, but in all seriousness though, I'm sure that Elden Ring is a game I would like, but the thing is, I'm just kind of burnt out on Souls games right now, so that's why I didn't play it. Plus, you know, it's kind of expensive as shit over here, and I know for a fact that they're gonna make, like, a Game of the Year edition with, like, a bunch more content to it for, like, $30, and, well, I'd rather just get that. So now you're probably wondering, well, why the hell did I play Eternal Ring instead? So early on in that year, I did a stream called... Totally not Dark Souls and totally not Elden Ring, where I play two games, and that being uh, Bleach Dark Soul on the DS and Eternal Ring on PS2, because I just thought it would be funny. And while I was playing Eternal Ring, I was surprisingly kind of enjoying it. Yeah, because I've never played the game before, but I've always heard people talk about it, and of course I've heard people talk shit on it and all this kind of stuff, but honestly, I actually think the game is, like, a lot better than most of the other, like, early FromSoft games that were like this. The only one that I think that is better than this is maybe, like, Shadow Tower Abyss, but when it comes to, like, the Kingsfield games, I actually like this one better. Even Kingsfield 4 I don't think like held up nearly as well as this game did, because I find that the flow of movement in this one is a lot more smoother than like all the other games, like I was actually pleasantly surprised at that. The only aspect of Eternal Ring that doesn't hold up well is just being able to look up and down with L2 and R2, which I do understand that there's a lot of people that hate that, and as for me, well, I've played like a shit ton of like PS1 games where you have to do that, and I've kind of gotten used to it over the years. So yeah, I kind of went into this one like not really expecting much, and then I ended up liking it a lot more than I thought I would. So yes, so so here's the thing with Eternal Ring that I really like is that, well, not only is it just like I said, the controls are like a lot better than you think they would be. But I also like the whole ring system that they have in here where you can like fuse different elementals to make different types of like magic spells and there's like a shit ton that you can do. It's actually quite interesting like how many like options you have. 
Plus, I like the game's atmosphere and its music. I think it's actually quite nice. And the game wasn't, like, super bullshit hard either. I mean, it does have some parts that are pretty tough, like, for especially the last boss in this game is a fucking asshole, but outside of that, though, like, most other parts in this game I didn't find to be, like, super frustratingly difficult. But one thing that I wish this game did have, though, was that I wish it had more weapon variety. Like, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of weapons you use in this game. But at the same time to that, though, I do understand that they are trying to go more towards the whole, like, magic ring system more so than melee weapons. But still, I think it would have been nice to have, like, more melee weapons in the game. But yeah, I gotta say, for a launch PS2 game, like, I was actually, like, pretty happy with it. Like, I think it's actually quite good. Now, maybe one day I might have to beat, uh, Ever Evergrace one day. <laughs> I don't know if that'll ever happen, because that game's pretty rough to go back to, but you never know, maybe I might. Alright, now the next two games here was kind of like this phase I was having where I kind of felt nostalgia for like a certain thing from my childhood, and that being motherfucking Bionicles. Yeah, you remember those toys from LEGO? So what I ended up doing was end up wanting to play through some Bionicle games, and I managed to beat two of them. And the first one that I beat was actually a Flash game called Bionicle Matanui Online, which almost sounds like an MMO, but it's not. So this was a game that I remember playing online back in the day, and it's kind of like a mist sort of game, but with uh, Bionicles, where you gotta like travel around the world and help people and their problems, you do puzzles and all this kind of stuff. But man, I just really love the way that this game looks. Like, this shot right here at the beach when you first start up the game, like, I just always loved this shot so much. I've even had, like, weird dreams where I've actually, like, was in this, like, shot. It was just kind of weird and funny when I look back on that. But yeah, so yeah, I really love, like, the way, like, this game looks. I love the atmosphere that it has. There's even some parts of it that actually sound a little bit creepy, too. And yes, as a kid, this is a game I got stuck on a lot of the times, and of course, I never thought to look up like a walkthrough, because I didn't think like you could actually look up walkthroughs back in the day. But of course nowadays, yeah, I ended up watching a video for a part that I was stuck on, and yeah, even as like playing it as an adult, there are still some parts in it that are a little bit tricky to figure out, but... So yeah, I ended up playing through it all just for the nostalgia's sake, and yeah, I, I kind of liked it. But I, this is a game that I can only recommend for those that have nostalgia for this game, or just have nostalgia for Bionicles in general, because, you know, obviously if you don't give a shit about this, then yeah, you're probably not gonna like this game. But it felt good to finally see, like, how the hell this game actually ended after all these years later of being curious about it. And now, as for the second Bionicle game that I beat, now this is one I actually didn't play back in the day, I just felt like wanted to playing it because I thought it looked kinda like, cool and interesting, and that being Bionicle Motoran's Adventure on the Game Boy Advance. So this is a side-scroller action platformer game with Bionicle characters, and it was actually developed by Argonaut Games. Yeah, the same company that got fucked over by Nintendo. So when I saw that this game was an action platformer, I was kind of like, you know, this game looks like it could actually be pretty fun. And I ended up playing through it, and yeah, I think it's a pretty decent game. It's nothing amazing, but I thought it was pretty solid for what it was. So you play as two different characters, and they have their advantages and disadvantages, so you have to like switch between them at certain parts. So it does kind of remind me of Donkey Kong Country in that aspect. But the one thing that does make it really different, though, is that uh, this is one of those games where you kind of have to, like, collect, like, a certain amount of, like, an object in order to, like, complete the level. So it does kind of have a bit of a maze, like, for it. I don't want to call it a Metroidvania, because it's not, but it definitely does have, like, some level designs that kind of do remind me of something that would be in one. Now, while all this does sound pretty good, the one thing about this game that I didn't like was that I found that the boss stages were very lackluster, and they also felt really recycled as well. And I do remember the controls in it being pretty decent, but I forget exactly, like, like, like you know, specific things, because it has been a few months since I played it, but I do remember it being, like, a pretty decently controlled game. But yeah, overall, I can say that, like, you know, as again, if you uh, loved Bionicles growing up, there's a chance that you maybe might have liked this game. I mean, I don't know if you would, like, absolutely, like, fall in love with it, best game ever kind of thing, but, you know, definitely not a bad tie-in game if I say so myself. And yeah, this is a game that if I had a Game Boy Advance back in the day, I probably would have enjoyed this quite a bit. And as for the next game that I completed, this is an RPG that I actually did have growing up, and that happens to be... Jade Cocoon on PS1. 
So this is a game that I had growing up. I think I got it at like a uh, like a thrift store or a yard sale in like the early 2000s and it was like dirt ass cheap at the time. And playing this as a kid, I did like the game, but I also remember there was a part in it where I died and I had to like restart like from like a very far away point. I didn't feel like wanting to do that all over again. So I actually literally did not play the game for many, 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 many years. And it wasn't until recently that yeah, I wanted to play through it again and actually fulfill and see the whole thing from beginning to end, and yeah, I did it. So I'm sure a lot of you know that this is a game where, uh, you know, uh, Heo Miyazaki from uh, Jubilee Studio was actually, like, a part of in this game. Like, he was involved with, like, the art direction and stuff, which is why this game looks really beautiful. And it happens to be, like, a monster-capturing RPG, kind of similar to Pokemon and SMT. But I would actually say this game is more similar to SMT for the sense that, like, both, like, your monsters that you capture and the trainer himself can actually take part in the battles and beat the shit out of things. And it's a pretty easygoing game, pretty chill, nothing super difficult. Yeah, I, just, I guess that just tells you how much I sucked at this game back then. It has some really great music, some really great uh, graphics and art direction, as I said before, with Jubilee Studio being involved. Even the game's story, I thought, it was pretty interesting and fun to learn about. Like, I really liked the whole, like, world that they created in the game. I thought it was very cool looking. And the story itself, I just thought was just uh, very interesting. I don't want to get into it all here and talk about it, but I did found it that it was actually a pretty cool story. That definitely did remind me of like a Ghibli Studio movie. But as much as I did enjoy my time with this game, the one thing that I will let people know about is that the farther you get into the game, I feel like that the game kind of does drag on a little bit because of the battles in this game. can feel like they can take a while to get through, mainly because, like, you can only send out, like, one monster at a time, so I feel like because of that, it really does make the battles feel like a lot longer than they should. But outside of that, I did enjoy my time with the game, and, you know, as I've been saying a lot, it just felt really nostalgic to just, like, go back and see all these, like, cool little places that they made in the game. And maybe eventually I might have to play the second one that was on PS2, because I've actually never played that one at all, and I've heard some people say that that one's actually, like, a lot better. And the next game we got happens to be on the Sega Genesis, and it's actually one of those games that people only talk about for its rarity, which, you know, it's, like, kind of whatever to me, I just want to play it because I think it looks cool. And that happens to be Crusade of Senti. Yes, that Atlas game that was on the Sega Genesis. So the easiest way I can sum up this game is that it's pretty much like the Sega Genesis answer to uh, Link to the Past. But I don't think it's like on the same level as Link to the Past, but I do think it does have a lot of charming stuff about it that I do really like a lot. Like the music in the game is really great, there's a lot of really cool locations you get to go to. And all the items that you use in this game are very unique. In fact, the items that you use are actually animals that help you out. Which I think is the most charming part about the game is that, like, there are parts in the game where you gotta, like, help an animal out. And he'll be like, oh, I'll help you out now. And then he'll just, like, fit right into your pocket somehow. Also, there's a song the Hedgehog cameo in it where he's just, like, laying down on the beach, which I thought was pretty funny. And the game wasn't crazy difficult either, which is always nice to see, but yeah, overall, I really enjoyed my time with this game, and it was nice to finally play this after, like, so many years of just only playing it for, like, a little bit and then just, like, never again. But yeah, I would recommend this if you haven't played this before. It's just a shame that it's, like, insanely expensive, but, you know, there are ways to play this game without having to pay those prices, and you know what they are. Alright, and the next game here is actually one of the few games that actually came out this year. But it's a game that's actually a remake of an old game, of course. And that happens to be Live Alive on the Nintendo Switch. So this is a game that I've known about for quite a few years, and I've actually even thought about, like, covering the game years ago with the fan-translated version, but, you know, I just never did because I just wanted to do, like, other Super Nintendo RPGs. And, uh, yeah, then out of nowhere, bam, we got a remake of it, and it just looks really fucking awesome. Because games like this is the reasons why I do like modern gaming for the fact that there's just so many, like, you know, old-ass games that have ch second chances of coming back again, and stuff that, like, you wouldn't expect. And after playing this game, after being curious about it with the remake version, I have to say, it was actually quite good. But also, uh, not exactly what I was expecting, but it was a, at least a very interesting experience. So, as you know, there's like a bunch of different characters you gotta play through and you gotta do all their different stories, and uh, all the different stories of these games are very different from each other, and a lot of them are very, like, gimmicky or have, like, their little quirks about them. 
For an example, there's like a modern one where you gotta take control as a, um, like a martial artist. Unfortunately, I forget his name right now, but yeah, he's like a martial artist, and there's no, like, exploration in it whatsoever. Like, literally, all you do is that you select through a menu of, like, fighters you gotta take on. Almost like a fighting game. It's actually quite charming and cool looking, and that's all you do. Take out all the fighters, then you learn their abilities, and then you take on the final boss, and it's actually pretty epic. And then after that, that's all there is. And then you have stories like Q, that happens to be the little circle white guy who kind of looks like Kirby. So you have him, where his story, like, literally has, like, no fighting in it whatsoever until, like, the very end of it. But it's mostly just, like, story about, like, being trapped on, like, a ship of a bunch of people. And it's actually a very good story, I will say, but that playing through that part almost felt like playing, like, a visual novel, almost. So knowing that the, some of the stories in this game are, like, very different from one another, there's a chance that, you know, you could be in the mood for playing an RPG, but then you pick, like, a story like Q's that, you know, doesn't really feel like an RPG at all, you're gonna be very confused. But me, personally, I don't consider that to be a bad thing, per se. I mean, I can understand why some people would be confused and be like, Okay, hey, what the fuck? I, this is an RPG. Like, this does not feel like one. Well, the one thing I will give this game is that I actually find this game is quite daring for the fact that they made a game like this that was so, like, off the wall and quirky and all that. But if you had to ask me, like, what my favorite story of this game was, I would probably say it would be, like, the near future one. I think the main character of that one was named Akira, and he had this, like, ability where he can, like, read people's minds. It, I thought that was probably my favorite story for that. Not only what did, I really liked his character, I liked his world and the whole story and, like, the whole, like, finale of it was really fucking epic. But I found that one felt the most, like, traditional RPG, you know, running around a map, running into monsters and fighting them, and then going into, like, dungeons, per se. Like, that's the one thing I really liked about it, and I felt like it was, like, fleshed out really well. And another thing I have to mention, too, is that this game is, like, really not that hard of a game at all. It's actually a very chill, uh, playthrough. The only parts where you really need to grind is, like, the ending part of the game when all the characters have to come together. But outside of that, there's really not much grinding you need to do. Not only because, like, you know, like, the fights are pretty, like, well-balanced as they are, but also because, you know, like I said, there were just some character stories where you don't really get a lot of opportunities to grind. So knowing all this, this is the type of game that I don't think you should go into it expecting it to be like the next FF6 or the next Chrono Trigger or the next Dragon Quest or you know any of those grand epic games like that at the time. I wouldn't go into it expecting like that because unlike those games this one doesn't have like the whole like big epic grand adventure aspect to it until like the very ending of the game. So those are just some things that I think you have to keep in mind when you do want to jump into uh, Live Alive is that you know, it's just a very, like, oddball, like, RPG that was Japan only for many, many, many years. And, yeah, I liked it. I enjoyed my time with it. And hopefully we'll get more games kind of similar to this that were also, like, lost in Japan for many years getting officially translated. That would be fucking awesome. So, uh, Atlas, uh, can you give us a Dispiria, please? And moving on. And, yeah, uh, we're in October season now, believe it or not. Now, usually what I like to do in October is that I like to keep, like, some of, like, the games that I've had in my backlog that are horror-related and try to play through them, like, in that month, and, and that year, I happened to complete three of them, and one of them was actually a fairly recent game at the time. So, the first one that I beat happens to be Elisa, the uh, PS1-looking horror game on Steam. So, I actually did day one this game back when it came out in uh, 2021, but unfortunately, the game had a very rough launch and it had like a lot of problems, but I didn't want to like return the game because I felt like that this game had so much like potential to be great and it had like I love the way it looks and everything. Like, as you know, like I love like PS1 games, so of course, seeing a new game that looks like a PS1 game and it's horror related with a lot of really awesome character and monster design, some great pre rendered back background, some nice creepy music that I really like, and yeah, it's just really fucking kick-ass looking. So I put faith in the developer that he was gonna update it and stuff, because he actually was very, like, open to a lot of, like, criticisms, and he was actually, like, listening to a lot of people's feedback and whatnot, and then, many months later, he made a big update, and a lot of things changed for the best. And this guy, I swear, he put, like, the extra mile. Not only did he just, like, fix, like, a lot of, like, glitches and all this type of stuff, but this dude literally added, like, a shit ton of free content. 
Like, there's a shit ton of outfits in the game, there's a lot more newer weapons, there's a lot more stuff you can get through, like, the New Game Plus, and there's a lot of, like, new secrets that they added. Like, it's really impressive that the fact that this guy was able to do all this in, like, the span of a couple months, because, you know, this is, like, a very small team. And I'm glad I hung on to it for that time, because, man, like, this game is just really great. Like, if you love the original Resident Evil game, and you want something that kind of has that, like, Alice in Wonderland-type vibes mixed with horror, I think you're definitely gonna love this game. Like, I think it's just really great now. Like, I can definitely recommend it now that, like, everything is fixed, and it has, like, a shit ton of content and replay value. Hell, I even think for $20, I actually think it's worth it for that now. Alright, and as for the next game, this is uh, yet another PS1 game. Well, the other game wasn't a PS1 game, it just looked like one. But this is an actual legit PS1 game, and it was one that I rented as a kid. And that happens to be... Jersey Devil. Yes, that 3D action platformer where you use a guy that kind of looks like a purple bat. In fact, on the cover art, he kind of looks a little bit like Batman, which is kind of funny. So as I said, I rented this game as a kid, and I really loved like the way it looked at the time. I mean, I still think it's like a decently graphically looking game, except for like the human characters. They look like shit, but all of the environments and stuff look pretty good. So yeah, I liked the way it looked at the time, the music was really great, and I just liked the whole, like, like, theme and the aesthetics that it has, like, it's like a Halloween platformer, I just think it's just really cool looking. But unfortunately, playing this game as a kid, I, like, really sucked at this game, like, I remember it being, like, really fucking hard, but then I played it as an adult, like, not that long ago, and I was just like, wow, this beginning part is, like, not that hard at all, like, why was I dying so much, like, did I suck that badly? Now, I will say, the game, like, later on, like, I still think it is a fairly easy game, but there are some parts of it that can be a little bit frustrating, though. Like, I remember there was a couple bosses that felt like they took forever to take down, and then there were some parts where, like, if you get hit, like, you get, like, the fallback, and then you just fall into a pit and die. I remember there was a boss where you had to jump across, like, a bunch of, like, platforms, and if you get hit, like, once, you, you literally die. <laughs> And there was a haunted house part that had, like, invisible floors that was also, like, annoying to get around, but outside of these frustrating aspects of it, though, it wasn't too bad of a playthrough, even though I did, like, miss, like, a bunch of, like, bonus stuff, but, you know, I just wanted to play through the game. But for, like, a 1997, like, uh, platformer in 3D, the controls on it were not too bad, to be honest. Like, yeah, like, obviously the camera angles suck, but that's probably the worst part about it. And maybe the hit detection on, like, the attacking is a little bit on the, like, the stiffer side. But otherwise, for an early 3D platformer without, like, analog stick control or anything, it wasn't too bad. In fact, I'm just glad it just didn't have tank controls, which makes me happy. But I will say that this is one of those games that I kind of wish got like a remake of some sorts because I think that the uh, the idea of it has a lot of potential to be really great. I just think it just has a couple aspects of it that obviously were not like the greatest even for the year that it came out. But it was cool to finally complete this game after many years of like, you know, playing it years ago and like getting stuck early on and actually seeing like the whole game now. And as for the next one, and this is the last one that I completed for October and that happens to be... Nosferatu on SNES. So this was a game that I always thought looked really cool, like I think it like has like a really awesome box art, although I would actually say that the Japanese box art is like way cooler because you get to see more details of the picture that you don't see on the North American cover. And I'll go out and say that out of all the games that I completed this year, this one was definitely the hardest one. So this is a side-scrolling uh, platformer game, but it's not like your typical one. This one kind of plays similar to like the old Prince of Persia game, so you kind of have to like take your time with like jumping down like from platforms because you know you can actually hurt yourself from jumping from a distance. So knowing this, yeah, there is a lot of like frustrating parts in this game. Not only is there a few bosses in this game that have some very tricky patterns to learn, but there's a lot of levels in this game that just have, like, a lot of, like, random shit thrown at you, and it's really hard to predict. And some of the levels later on can get kind of long, too. But probably the most annoying aspect for me is that, uh, trying to do the run and slide to get underneath, like, certain, uh, areas is probably the most frustrating part for me, because... There's some parts where, like, they barely give you enough room to, like, run and slide. And trying to do the run and slide move is a little bit on the janky side, so trying to do that in, like, a little tiny space is just, yeah, very, very frustrating. And I even hurt, like, my fingers trying to get through them. 
Like, I can put up with the other game's bullshit with, like, the random shit thrown at you and, like, the whole, like, bosses having, like, tricky patterns. Like, I can put up with that. But that whole aspect that I just explained there with, like, the run and slide, yeah, that was just, ugh, I, I hated that. So as you can tell, yeah, this game is not particularly great, unfortunately, but the reason why I wanted to play through it was because, well, I thought the game always fascinated me, and I always wanted to see what the whole game was like, because I've heard from many people that this game was really hard, and but it does have a very cool style to it, though. Like, I really like the game's backgrounds during the whole, like, the boss stages. I think those are, like, really cool looking, and the game has a pretty interesting OST. Well, there are some songs on it that are a little bit repetitive and annoying, but there are some songs that are kind of cool sounding though. So yeah, I guess you can tell that, yeah, I was kind of in the mood for some, like, janky movement type of game, and well, this is definitely it, so yeah. If you want to have a janky movement type game, like Old Prince of Persia, that's also, like, really hard, then this is the game, but I wouldn't recommend paying, like, the stupid astronomical prices that it goes for physically, so yeah, might as well just emulate this one. Alright, now moving on to Out of Horror Month, we actually got another Super Nintendo game, and this one is also really hard, but I actually like this one a lot more. And that happens to be Indiana Jones Greatest Adventures, you know, the LucasArts Indiana Jones game on Super Nintendo where it combines all three movies into one game, and it also does share aspects to the Star Wars games as well. Well, the Star Wars games, as much as I like them, I find they are, like, way too insanely hard for me. Where, with the Indiana Jones game, while it is really hard, I actually find this one to be a little bit easier, at least for me. So yeah, this game it has a lot of different aspects to it. Like, you got, like, your typical, like, uh, action platforming sections, and yes, you have a whip, so of course a lot of people like to compare it to Castlevania, which is kind of cool. And then you got, like, like minecart stages, stages where you're getting chased down by a boulder, and then you got a stage where you gotta, like, go in an airplane and shoot down, uh, 20 airplanes. I actually thought that mission was, like, really fucking annoying, by the way. <laughs> and the cool thing about this game, too, is that, uh, it actually follows the movies, like, very well. Like, like, you can actually picture, like, every single scene that they included here, and it's actually pretty great. And one funny thing that I have to mention is that, uh, the game over screen in this game I find to be really funny, just the way how, um, Indy's dad just looks at you like, huh? <laughs> like, I don't know why, it just always cracks me up. So yeah, it's a pretty well-made game that has good controls, good music and graphics, and all that kind of fun stuff. It's just pretty difficult. That's really my only thing about this game when it comes to recommending it. But I can definitely say that it's better than some of the NES games, so that's for damn sure. Alright, and as for the next game that I completed, this is the last RPG that I completed, and that happens to be Trails from Zero, the long-lost Trails game that we never got until recently. And this is a game that, I think if the Vita was a bit more successful, well, okay, maybe not a bit more, maybe like a lot more successful, I think this game probably could have came out back in the day, but, well, as you know, that didn't happen. So yes, once I got into this series and wanted to play through all the Trails games, these were like sort of the lost ones that we never played back then, and yeah, even though I started with Cold Steel 1, I never felt like I was like confused on losing out on stuff that were mentioned from this game, but now that I finally played through it, I thought it was actually quite nice. One thing that I will say for sure is that uh, Trails from Zero, I definitely do like better than the, the Trails in the Sky games, and I like those games just fine, at least mainly the second one. But I'm not sure if I would put the uh, Trails from Zero over the Cold Steel game. I'm not sure yet. I would have to really play uh, Trails from Azure, which comes out uh, sometime in 2023. I forget, like, exactly when they said it was coming out. But yeah, anyways, this is still a very good entry in the series, though. Like, for one, the pacing in it is just way better than a lot of, like, some of the other games in the series. It's also not even a long game, either. Like, I think it took me, like, 38 hours to beat this game. Like, for a Trails game, that's pretty damn short. Also, the game's story I thought was really cool. It was finally good to see, like, what happens during all through this shit. And also, I really liked Randy as a character in this one. Now, I did like him a lot in the third game as well, but it was just really cool to see, like, how he is in, like, the very beginning. In fact, I actually found his dialogue in this one was a lot more funnier than the later games. But yeah, that's all I'm gonna say about this one, because I do want to keep this one short, because, you know, I don't want to, like, bog you all down talking about, like, every single little detail about the Trails games, because I know there's still a lot of people that haven't played them yet, and I, I really enjoyed them a lot, because I love the world building so much, and the music, and all that kind of fun shit. 
But one thing I will add quickly was that I was just really happy to see that they brought back the, the chest messages when you open up a chest and you examine the chest as it's open, it displays like a stupid random message and it's always like funny ass jokes. I thought that was just great. So yeah, I'll end it there. So as for the next game that I finished, happens to be Lost Ruins, which is also on PC. And it happens to be an indie game that is also a action platformer metroidvania. Yeah, I know, that sounds very typical, right? And yes, I finally beat another metroidvania game! Because as I always say, I'm terrible at them. And yes, I played this one on the easiest difficulty, because I know for a fact if I played this game on normal, like, I probably would have died, like, a shit ton of times. So yes, this is a Metroidvania game that has a really awesome pixel art style for that. Like, I really love, like, the effects that they use on, like, the shadows and all this type of stuff. It just looks really, really nice. So you play as this girl who has, like, no memory. Yeah, I know, typical amnesia. But the thing that's interesting about it was that uh, there's a lot of, like, really cool weapons and, like, magic spells you can play around with. If I ever do play this game again, I can definitely mess with, like, a very interesting build, which would be really fun. And there's a lot of interesting bosses to fight, which I thought were pretty cool. And the game's, like, levels... Now, like I said, I'm usually pretty shit at Metroidvania games because I always get lost all the time. Well, this one, I didn't find it to be, like, super confusing. Which is good for people like me who always gets lost in all these games all the time. Yeah, it's a good thing I didn't get lost in Lost Ruins, am I right? And there's not really much else to say about it. I just thought it was just a really cool looking game with like really nice like pixel art graphics and it was actually played pretty well and I really enjoyed it. And it was not like insanely difficult on the easiest difficulty. You'd be surprised how many games are still hard as shit on easy. But when it comes to these uh, Metroidvania games that are made by indie devs that I've been playing that and there's not very many of them, I still think Toho Luna Nights still might be my favorite, but this one is not far behind. And now, we're moving on to the final two games that I beat this year. And this is yet another game that got released this year. And yes, it's also a game that's old that got remade, and that is Klonoa. So yes, I got the Klonoa collection on the Switch, and I managed to beat the, the first one recently. Now, Klonoa is one of those games that I think I do remember seeing it, like, at the store, like, many years ago, but, you know, I don't really thought I think much about it, but it wasn't until, like, years later is when I started hearing people talk about it, and people were saying, oh yeah, it was only, like, one of the greatest PS1 games ever made, you know? But even back when the retro prices were not, like, stupid as they are today, the game was still, like, not easy to come across, and then eventually I was just like, well, fuck it, I'll just emulate it just to see if I like it. And I remember, uh, playing through, like, the first couple stages through there, and I remember it being pretty good, but, you know, I just never, like, you know, took the time and actually played through the whole game, you know? But when this remake got announced, I was like, well, this is definitely a good time to actually play through this shit. Just like what I said about with uh, Live Alive, because, you know, I'm always willing to support these, like, you know, like, oddball games getting remade. And after completing through the game, I can say that I enjoyed it quite a bit. I thought it was actually a pretty solid platformer, or 2.5D platformer, I should say. So the one thing that is really cool about this game is, like, the way how, like, the level goes where you can actually, like, see, like, other parts of, like, the platforming, like, as you go around, like, a corner. I think that's really cool. And plus, there's a lot of stuff you can, like, pick up and throw into, like, the background, the foreground. And the game's music is pretty chill and nice and relaxing. And then also, the game's graphics are really awesome looking. And you know what? Even the original PS1 game, like, still had really nice graphics for the time. So just being able to see it get remade like this is just, like, wow. But I will say, the game does not have that many levels in the game. I was actually surprised I was able to complete it, like, pretty quickly. But I will also say that the final two levels of the game were, like, really, really long. In fact, on one of them, I actually got a game over because I finally ran out of lives, and then I had to, like, redo the level all over again. So yeah, that was slightly annoying. Also, whenever Klonoa does the whole, like, wind movement thing to pick up the enemies, I do find that it is a little bit on the, uh, the finicky side, but outside of that, though, like, the controls in it are, like, really damn good. And I can say it's just a very solid platformer that I'm really happy to complete through. Now, I don't know if I would say this game is a masterpiece, like some people try to claim it to be. In fact, I would actually say that's kind of overrating it a little bit, but I did think it was a pretty good, solid game that is very nice and chill and relaxing, and it's not, like, super hard or anything, and hopefully I'll play the second one sometime soon. And now, finally, as for the final game that I completed in 2022, I actually beat this game like a couple days ago as I'm recording this, and that game happens to be 
Trigger Witch on PC, and as I was trying to say that, I almost said Bullet Witch, and that would have been like in a totally different game, but no, it, it's Trigger Witch. So this is another indie game that's a uh, top-down twin-stick shooter, and it's kind of funny that we started with one being Sturmfront, and now we end off with one. But while Sturmwind was more arcade like this one is kind of more like adventure aspect, sort of like Zelda. In fact, the game looks a lot like uh, Link to the Past, but with, like, you know, twin-stick shooter action, so it's actually a lot of fun. So firstly, I have to say that the whole concept of this game is just really funny to me, just being able to see, like, a little, like, witch just having, like, big-ass, like giant machine guns shooting down everything with blood and violence it's just really great and the game in general is pretty humorous for that well for one not only is the game's dialogue is kind of funny but also there's just like guns everywhere like even the church has guns in it <laughs> like it's just some fucking craziness also the game's ending was like a really huge ass twist of craziness that i was not expecting and i won't spoil it here in case you haven't played it but but I'll just say that it's crazy awesome and I love it. And just like in uh, a Zelda game, you know, you go to different dungeons and there are some little puzzles here and there, but all the puzzles are really easy though, like they're not hard, like I never had to resort using a walkthrough which should tell you something. And at every dungeon you also acquire a new gun to your collection and you can like upgrade them and all that and it's just really fun to mess with the different guns and like shooting styles. So yeah, if you want something that's more arcade like then play Sturmfront, but if you want something that's more like Legend of Zelda, but with like a twist of uh, bullet hell shooting, then yeah, I would recommend getting Trigger Witch for sure. They're just Both of them are just a hell of a good time. And that'll be it for uh, the games that I beat on my own in 2022. So what are some of the games that you finished in 2022 that you're happy to complete, whether it be a brand new release that came out, or a game that's been on your backlog for like ever that you've always wanted to play through, or, you know, any type of that, type, that type of shit. So anyways, with that said, thanks for watching and commenting, and have yourselves a great day.